Next up, trade, and who better to speak to that than U.S. Trade Representative Mike Froman, just back this morning uh, from Vietnam, which he characterized as a very good trip. Ambassador Froman has a storied career. He worked at Treasury, the National Security Council, the National Economic Council. He'll sit down with Steve Clemens for a deep dive into administration's trade efforts and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Steve? Great. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Come on up. Come to my living room, but let's get rid of it. You don't want the governor's coffee. I think I'll skip that. Yeah, we don't, you know, we're going to put this. My living room is usually neater than, than they leave. Look at, look at all this. That's what you get for having Jonathan yeah, Carl here. You Jonathan know. Carl is complicated. Uh, good to be with all of you. Mike, join, thank you for coming in from Pleasure. Vietnam specifically for this, Absolutely. For this forum. Absolutely. So have you ever, in, in your, in your um, experience in trade policy, seen so much interest in what you do? Uh, in a, the media, there's an awful lot of this last right week now. has been sort of intense. It's been uh, it's been a very uh, intense week, as you said. A lot of good action uh, up on Capitol Hill. We also had a, a so round. characterize good for me. Well, yeah, <laughs> I think you know yesterday or the day before yesterday, they've lost a little bit. I guess it was yesterday. The Senate Finance Committee uh, voted out by I believe it was 20 to six, so a good bipartisan vote. A whole series of um, a, a trade promotion authority bill, plus a whole series of other bills related to trade. So, so you got a deal to, mm -hmm. to have uh, TPA, correct? As distinct from TPP, there's a lot of you're like worse than the Pentagon with all these acronyms. But, and but so you got a deal to 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 get TPA. What did you have to give up to get it? Well, this was really uh, uh, Chairman Hatch and I know, uh, but Senator what did you? What, I mean, what I mean, you were pulling the strings. So, <laughs> no, yeah. this was really between them because it's really uh, about congressional prerogative. Mm -hmm. And they worked out, I think, a, a very strong bill, as evidenced by the vote uh, behind it, that uh, makes sure that Congress plays a very active role in defining our negotiating objectives. And they updated the negotiative, negotiating objectives from the last grant of, uh, of TPA, which was back now, in 2002. Now, haven't most of the negotiations already happened? Well, for TPP, we're definitely in the uh, end game. But this is a broader grant of trade promotion authority. It's for a period of time. It will cover the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. It will cover negotiations that are underway uh, in Geneva and in and around the WTO um, and what other negotiations might might pop up in the future. But it includes things like binding and enforceable uh, labor and environmental provisions. It includes uh, negotiating objectives regarding the digital economy, which didn't exist before. Uh, it includes negotiating objectives around state-owned enterprises. So in all those ways, it was, very, it was a very good effort to update uh, trade promotion authority. It also has a lot of new procedures around transparency and Congress's role in oversight of trade policy, which I think is very important that Congress, this is the way that Congress demonstrates and exercises its oversight over trade policy. There's no area of policy where there's more collaboration than trade policy as between the executive and Congress, and this helps write into law what the procedure should be for that collaboration. So you probably know my next question. Elizabeth Warren remains unconvinced. We'll, we'll, we'll call it that. What, what do you, do, do you think that she raises any issues that have merit? Well, absolutely. Her, yeah. Ab absolutely. Look, a lot of the issues that the, the critics of our trade agenda more broadly, whether it's uh, Senator Warren or others, uh, uh, certainly have merits. Um, you know, we are concerned about the impact of globalization on jobs and wages in the U.S. over the last uh, few decades. Uh, in our view, trade agreements is how you shape globalization. It's our opportunity to open other markets disproportionately to our exports because our market's already open. A lot of other markets have much higher barriers. And it's our way of raising labor, environmental, and other standards in these countries so we have a more level playing field between our workers. But the concerns that are raised are, are absolutely uh, legitimate. We take them very seriously, and we think that we're dealing with them constructively through these negotiations. So you're, you're a smart man. And, and one of the things, you know, when you think about the, econo the global economy and these macro levels, and you've been negotiating trade deals to lower tariffs, at the same time, the dollar is going through the roof. You see China slowing down a bit. You see Europe in a deflationary black hole. You don't see a lot of optimism out there in the world. And for a variety of reasons, the strong dollar is, is rising. Doesn't the strong dollar just act like a tsunami and wipe out all the good stuff you're trying to do? Well, of course, having worked at the Treasury Department, I can certainly say that only the Treasury Department comments on the level of the dollar, and I'm not going to break that. Uh, I'm not going to break that now. But oh, look, all I would say is um, uh, uh, certainly there are uh, broad macroeconomic forces at work right now. And it's in the United States' interest that we have other economies growing, growing through domestic demand, um, and also opening themselves up to our exports. We know that for us, we've been doing well, we've been growing, we've been adding jobs in the U.S., that to really get back to the kind of full employment and the high wage jobs 
that we want to see, we've got to be able to access the 95% of the consumers that live outside the United States. You know, we're going to grow at, at 2 to 3% here in the United States. We have economies abroad growing at 4, 5, 6, 7, 8%. We need to be part of that future. And one reason why the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is so important is that these are the fastest growing countries in the world, fastest mm -hmm. growing markets in the world. They're going to be the, the middle class, the, the consuming middle class of Asia is expected to grow from about 540 million people right now to over 3 billion people in 2030. And the question is, uh, whose products are they going to buy? And we want them to buy made in America, grown I mean, in America I mean, the OECD products. targets are pretty staggering when you look at the, the, the growth of the global middle class in Asia and the relative shrinking of the U.S. share of that. I mean, it's, right. it's, a, it, 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 it's an area that you know, raises a lot of interesting questions, but, but, but that's for another conference. And, 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 the, and the key thing about that is this region is so important. The, what's very important is what the rules of the road are mm -hmm. that are going to define trade in this region. And we think it's vitally important that, that we be on the field showing leadership, defining the rules of the road with our trading partners, not seeing that Now, role Joe Manchin, else. Senator Manchin was up here earlier. Um, he's not a big fan of the trade deal. He likes you personally, but you know, the but trade like deal, uh, he said not, not, not enough for him yet. But, I, but he did make the comment that in energy policy, and particularly with Keystone, which he supported, and he and Senator Hoven, um, who I heard might be in the neighborhood uh, in a while, uh, he said, why would we not do this kind of energy deal with our closest ally ever, Canada? Now, how is Canada behaving in TPP land? Well, you know, we have, I heard you were about to kick them out. Well, we have a uh, look, we have a very broad and deep economic relationship with Canada, and as neighbors, there are a lot of very positive big, things going on. There's a broad on. and deep economic relationship, but yeah, but we also have our, our trade issues, and yeah. you know, when, when Canada asked to join TPP, and they were one of the late entrants into TPP, one of the issues that we said was clear is that we were going to have to deal with issues that weren't. Uh, dealt with uh, necessarily in, in NAFTA. Mm -hmm. You know, the TPP is in many respects the renegotiation of NAFTA. People think about it in terms of the labor and environmental provisions vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, but equally importantly, there were some market access issues vis-a-vis -vis Canada, like certain agricultural issues. And so uh, we are looking forward to Canada engaging as all the other countries have engaged in a serious negotiation. And are you still waiting or have they we have not yet heard the message? Well, we have, we've not yet. Uh, uh, seen the kind of engagement that uh, that we'd like to see. So can you just that. expel them and say we'll get we'll get back to uh, you? Our our goal and our goal is to finish TPP with all twelve partners. That that remains our goal, and that's where our focus is. Okay. Now, Japan, when you started this, was another uh, country that was a bit recalcitrant, won it in, but but I know Ford, I know a lot of the automakers were saying, look, we don't want to relive the 1980s and 1990s of, you know, Japan getting in the door and then just doing nothing on agriculture, nothing on autos. You've got Prime Minister Abe of Japan coming here next week. Uh, President Obama is going to, you know, have a, a big ceremony at the White House. So, so how, how's Japan on your radar? Well, I've just come back from there. I was in Japan yeah. and, and Vietnam over the last uh, few days. And we had very constructive discussions. We, you know, for the last year or so, the main issues between us have been agriculture and automobiles. And our teams have been meeting almost every three or four weeks to, to make progress on the issues. And we still have remaining issues, but we've made very substantial progress. Are you expecting anything from an you know, omiyage from uh, uh, the Japanese on their visit? No, I, look, we're, we're, we're not uh, expecting an announcement of a, of a final deal or anything of that sort at this visit, uh, but we do think this is a good opportunity for the, the two leaders to review the quite substantial progress that's been made and also uh, to, to further the work towards, towards filling in the, uh, the remaining issues. So you think Japan will be fully in? Look, I think, they've, I think they see very, very much the importance of TPP, both economically and strategically, uh, from their perspective. As you know, when Prime Minister Abe came in and laid out his economics strategy, it had three arrows, and the third arrow was structural reform, and he linked Japan's entry into TPP as a key driver of structural reform. And most economists that, that one talks to thinks that that arrow has been lagging behind the fiscal and the monetary uh, arrow, and TPP is a, is a good mechanism for moving that forward. So um, we are very much looking forward for, to seeing how uh, the Prime Minister will be delivering on his own agenda and use TPP to do so. You know, yesterday we had a forum on China, uh, the Atlantic did, that was sort of the preamble to this, a spotlight on China. 
And you're friends with Doug Paul, right? Sure. Doug, so Doug Paul, who's at, at the Carnegie Endowment, great China expert advisor, to, you know, made a, made a statement. He said this wasn't personal about Mike Froman, but he said, never in all time in all of history has such a trade deal been pursued so poorly. Uh, and, 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 this, and, it was, uh, and, and his comment was that many of the people in the Congress were, you know, over half of them weren't there six years ago. They haven't gone through uh, the trade debates of the 80s and 90s. They haven't uh, necessarily been tuned in to the costs and benefits, the winners and losers um, that come with trade deals. And you, and you and I have talked about the fact that there are winners and losers, but, but people aren't armed with the data, at least from your perspective, on what is happening, and that, that labor groups, environmental groups, have been far more effective uh, at conveying what the cost side of the equation is. Would, what would you like to say to Doug Paul? Well, look, I think he's pointing out something very important, which is uh, there has been a lot of turnover in Congress, and these are complex uh, deals, and uh, as a result, it takes some time and effort to bring uh, everybody up to speed. It, with TPP, we've now had more than 1,700 briefings in Congress on TPP, and that's not including TTIP. How many? 1,700. Um, and we meet with wow. members in, individually, in groups, committees, caucuses, wh however they want to meet, going through issue by issue. And uh, for example, uh, 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 Sandy Levin, Congressman Levin, uh, last year organized a series of sessions uh, with the Ways and Means Democrats, where we went chapter by chapter, hour, hour and a half, deeper dive into it. And more recently, Leader Pelosi has led a uh, really a terrific set of briefings for the House Democratic Caucus, again, where we've gone in and walked through the text uh, in great detail, issue, issue by issue, to answer questions, explain what we're negotiating. Uh, and it takes that kind of work, I think, to, to bring people up to speed, address their concerns, make sure we're getting their input into the negotiations, um, and, uh, and get them comfortable with it. And, and that's the kind of work that, uh, that we have been doing and that we're going to need to continue to do between now and when TPP comes up for a vote. Why are the genetic generic pharmaceuticals industry so upset about the deal? Well, you know, the, when it comes to intellectual property rights, this is one of the most challenging issues in the negotiation. Um, domestically, we have both strong pharmaceutical and, and, and biotech industries, strong generic industry, um, and of course, um, uh, strong um, uh, advocates for access to medicines, affordable medicines, particularly in developing countries. And what Congress has done, it goes back uh, to, to really 2007, uh, Congress has done, it's given us direction that when it comes to trade deals, we should strike a balance between promoting innovation, and much of the, of the innovation in the pharmaceutical area is done here in the United States, and ensuring affordable access to medicines, uh, particularly in developing countries. And so our, our efforts to negotiate an IPR chapter are based on those two, on those two principles. Uh, we value generic medicines very highly. About 85% mm -hmm. of all prescriptions in the U.S. are filled by generics. And so a strong generics industry is vitally important for us as well. But we also need to make sure that we've got the proper incentives in place to promote innovation so that there is a pipeline of drugs that generics can ultimately produce. There is no innovation, there cannot be generics. And so it's, it's uh, always an effort both in our domestic law and Congress has spoken on that issue and, and created certain parameters for that. That, uh, uh, that we take as a touchstone in our negotiations, but also in our international negotiations. And the other arena that, that seems to be out there, maybe it's in the intellectual property side either, is that a lot of folks that were involved in um, the fight over net neutrality and over content on the internet and sort of say that what this trade deal does is it, is it doesn't look at the fact that that battle was already fought and sort of largely won in the U.S. So what would you say to those people that worry that this is going to distort yeah. the rights of fair use and, and, and uh, uh, that, that copyright of film and entertainment is going to get a lot more rigid? You know, and, and I, I know that they're not your biggest supporters, but Rob Scott at EPI and, and, and Lori Wallach um, have been out there saying that this agreement would give companies the right to challenge governments and, and to hold governments to task themselves and so that it creates sort of sovereign entities, if you will, and sovereign legal rights within corporations. And, and that's something that I don't know if that's true or not true, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. Let me, those are two separate issues. Right. Let, me, let me take both. First on, the, on the, uh, the digital economy and the intellectual property issues, I think they are completely wrong. And, I, and we've made that absolutely clear. What we have done is there's nothing in this bill in, in our trade agreement that comes from what we call 
uh, SOPA or PIPA, the, the, the battle that you mentioned, uh, it comes off of instead uh, existing, uh, the existing balances in US law. For example, we believe strongly in copyright and in IPR enforcement. We have 40 million Americans who owe their jobs to some IP intensive industry. But at the same time, this is the first trade agreement ever that will establish the principles of exceptions and limitations to copyright, similar to our fair use doctrine. So for the first time in a trade agreement, we're actually promoting that kind of balance, mm. uh, not, uh, not, going the, not going the other way. And we've taken their input on a variety of other issues, including uh, what's called uh, ISP liability to make sure that, that internet service providers um, uh, have a safe harbor from liability, uh, provided that they, they do the right things on, on, uh, on content. And, uh, and we, again, we take that off of, from existing so U.S. law. what's the coolest wow thing that we are not talking about, writing about in this trade deal? Like, I we were talking about beer in Colorado last time we were together. That's, that's right. You we went epic, to a beer place. You were talking company. about mm. how this beer uh, maker was going to benefit. I mean, I found that a wow. So what's the cool? How well, do you, how do you de wong We have so many cool things. Yeah. What, trade, yeah right? What's the coolest? Can't limit it to wine. I mean, like, I think, uh, just to build on the, on the beer reference, when yeah. I travel around the country, at every city I go to, a meeting with small businesses, small right. and medium-sized businesses that see huge opportunity in exporting abroad through this trade agreement. Um, whether it's uh, Jet Incorporated in, in Cleveland or Concord Supply in San Antonio. Have you been uh, up to North Dakota? I have not yet been to North Dakota, but I hope somebody from North Dakota will be able to tell me uh, yeah? what, what kind of opportunities there are there. There are crazy opportunities in North Dakota. Oh, there Jesus, wow. Hey, what everybody, Senator John Hoven. From North Dakota. Oh, yeah. What are you doing here? You're just dropping by? I heard yeah, that yeah. Uh, I heard there were some exciting things going on, particularly in the world of trade, so I thought I'd stop by and Joe Manchin find out was what's here. up. Democrat Joe Manchin was here just kicking the heck out of this trade promotion I thing. I know. But well, you're, you, you, you're, you work for Barack Obama, right? You work for, you, you indeed, know you work indeed, for Barack Obama. Yeah. Same couch. We're on the same couch. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Indeed. No, I, who's going fact, to get, who's gonna get more in more trouble at home tonight? Uh, I don't know, but I know that uh, Joe and I were supposed to be here together. We work together a lot, particularly on energy. Uh, but I think on this one, we may be, uh, have a difference of opinion. I, I uh, want to see us expand trade, and I think with TPA and TPP, we have an opportunity to do that. We're working through so it I now. I was just asking him about small businesses, and he's been visiting all over the country. Mike really wants to go to North Dakota. I don't know if you heard that. Well, I don't blame him. He but, should. But it's what a do you, great place. What do you go and what your small businesses in, in North Dakota – uh, the ones that aren't in fracking, but you know, maybe are, are there, tell me how you would describe the opportunities or the costs of, of TPP and TPA. I TPP. love it, I love it. Here's my chance to brag a little a bit about my state. That, thank you, Steve. Uh, we are the second largest oil producing state in the nation, second only to Texas. We produce over a million barrels a day, 1.2 million barrels a day and growing. Uh, but we produce energy from all different sources, both traditional and renewable. We are also the number one ag state in the union. So mm. if there's anybody here from Kansas or Nebraska or wants to take me on, I'm ready, we'll debate it. But we, we lead the nation in the production of uh, 14 different major crops, everything from honey to wheat to edible beans to peas and lentils. And you know what? We'd like to export a lot of those things. And cattle, mm. we have more cattle than people. We'd like to send some of that beautiful <laughs> prime beef uh, to countries uh, throughout the Pacific. So what did, I mean, since we both have you here, um, what has Mike Froman and the negotiations not yet delivered that you'd like to see delivered in, in, a, in a trade deal? You know, we're just starting to look at the deal. As you know, the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Orrin Hatch and uh, Ron Wyden came together in bipartisan fashion, and the Senate Finance Committee has put forward a TPA agreement and uh, we'll be bringing that to the Senate floor, and that will really set the wheels in motion for us to uh, move to uh, TPP, uh, which we'll do. We're gonna have to look at the agreement. Undoubtedly, there will be some modifications. One you may have talked about today uh, are the currency components, uh, making sure that uh, there aren't currency manipulations, that kind of thing. Uh, I saw Governor Kasich was here. He, uh, Rob Portman, Senator from uh, Ohio, who used to have your job, indeed, and he and I, Rob and I are close. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the same uh, alma mater. We both graduated from Dartmouth, so I work a lot with Rob. They're going to bring up that concern. Other people will have some other issues, so we'll have to work through the agreement they've negotiated. But but I do think I I think the votes are going to be there to pass it. Mike, let me ask you the the 
question I've always had, you know, with trade, when I've talked about trade or been interviewed, you know, I, I used to be in this business. The, the thing that I find missing, and you're not responsible, you're the trade silo guy. You can't govern what Treasury and Jack Lew does, as you just said. But when you look at, at what, take, what would it take to make a strategic leap for the health of the U.S. economy, more boats rising together, I think the concern is when you look at the financial crisis and its impact, if you look at high-wage jobs, we're still a million short in terms of creating it. If you look at mid-wage jobs, you're still a million short. If you look at low-wage jobs, America's producing them like crazy. And so in the middle of that storm, which we may still be in for a lot of folks, trade looks destabilizing, it looks uncertain. And, and some people like Joe Manchin said, I could be for a trade deal if we also got corporate tax reform and we didn't see U.S. firms moving abroad because of these. So, so the unfair question I have is, why can't someone like Barack Obama bring all of the economic mandarins together and get a cohesive economic strategy for the country that would deal, deal on all fronts so that you're not carrying the burden for every single problem? Well, look, I, I think uh, obviously the president uh, has a cohesive strategy. He's laid it out, wants to pursue a, a, any number of areas, whether it's on infrastructure, uh, tax reform, uh, immigration but he sort reform. of tossed you out to the sharks, right? And, or, and yeah. trade. But let me say, just because of where we are in trade, it, this is very much consistent with, with dealing with that problem. You know, right now, and, and I, see, I see this all the time, and I'm sure the senator does as well, companies come through and say, the U.S. is a great place to invest. You've got a great market, you've got the rule of law, you have an entrepreneurial culture, you have a skilled workforce, now we have abundant sources of affordable energy. And when we're done with these two trade agreements, TPP and TTIP, with the Asia-Pacific and with the EU, we'll have free trade with two-thirds of the global economy. And that makes the U.S. the production platform of choice, the place where it makes sense to put their next factory, both for the U.S. market, but also for export all over the world. And we see that. You know, in the paper the other day, there was a story that Audi, I think it was, was making a decision between, should we put our, our next factory in the United States or in Mexico? Mm. And they chose Mexico because Mexico has more free trade agreements. They huh. can export from Mexico duty-free to more markets. That shouldn't be the way it is. We, want, we need to finish TPP and TTIP precisely so that those kinds of decisions would be made to put the next factory in the U.S. So John and I need to have a you know, I'm gonna discussion. Leave you. you don't have to leave just yet, but let me take just a couple of quick questions for Mike, because he's got to get back and talk to the president over here. Um, where Jean-Francois Boisson, right there in the back? No, no, okay, right here. Oh, Paula Stern. Yes, sir. There we go. Right Where's there. Jean-Francois? Jean-Francois was just scratching his head. Thank you. Um, th thank you so much. So um, short, short form. Yeah, my question this is really. This is Paula Stern. She's great. So no yeah, thanks. Just get my, to the question. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's really about the adjustment assistance, trade adjustment assistance. How you can tie that discussion, which seems to be in a silo called trade, with the discussion that has been going on all day today and yesterday about the technological changes in our globalized, digitized economy. Right. You've got this tech hire program at the White House. I don't see any communication that wraps together uh, the, uh, and deals with the anxiety which is expressed through the representatives and the senators about the changing uh, shape uh, uh, and uh, requirements for the necessary skills to get those uh, jobs and, and to remove the wage stagnation which we are experiencing during this so period. So trade adjustment assistance, and I would put in there sort of worker retraining, all of that used yeah. to be the fig leaf to pass trade deals. And you, we used to do a crappy job. I worked for Jeff Bingham, and we did it for Roswell, New Mexico, and Gene's plants, and those people never really got the assistance they needed. But today it seems like we might be better. But to, to Paula's question, what do you think the infrastructure of adjustment uh, needs that, that we should have today? Because there are losers in trade deals. Absolutely. Look, first of all, uh, Yesterday in the Senate Finance Committee, on a bipartisan basis, they did vote out a renewal of the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program for six years. It covers services workers, um, and uh, you know, I, I, it's a it's an important part of the overall package uh, moving forward. But certainly, there is more that can and should be done when it comes to a comprehensive job training program. The Vice President has done a lot of work on this. Uh, the, we, the, the President has a proposal in his budget around job training uh, that is a more comprehensive. A lot of the work that we've been doing with community colleges has been linked to overall the, the job training and the, and the demand-driven uh, training exercises. And so there is much more to be done there. I think it's really a matter of what's doable. And 
course, we always look to working with Congress to get as much done in that area as possible. And, and let me add, Mike, the, the last uh, trade agreements we did were the U.S., South Korean, Panama, and Colombia, and trade adjustment assistance was part of that agreement, so you're going to see that again. Great. Right over here. Kenosha san Since we have Prime Minister Abe coming in, this is Abe's... Uh, uh, press guy. Not, no, okay. he's, 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 <laughs> no. He's, no, he's not. He's not. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, Kyoto, you, Kyoto in, News. Okay. I must say, you emphasize that uh, you have a uh, constructive discussion and uh, made a substantial progress with uh, Japan and Vietnam. Uh, however, you have not uh, struck a deal with uh, your counterpart of the uh, Japanese government. So, uh, what is the most difficult part of, uh, for your negotiation with Japan? And the, how confident are you? in a striking a deal uh, finally with uh, all members of 11 country as uh, early as May or later. Thank you. Did you hear that? I did. Okay. I think the, look, the most uh, challenging issues between the U.S. and Japan, and by the way, first I should say that uh, Japan at the negotiating table with all 12 TPP partners, we tend to see things more alike than differently, whether it's on intellectual property rights or state-owned enterprises. So uh, we have been partners in a number of important issues. But when you disagree, but how intense is it? It's, it's intense. It's around yeah. agriculture and autos. These are two very important uh, and, sets and of currency. issues for us. And currency. And, and uh, as I said, we made substantial progress when I was there, meeting with, with Minister Amari and his team uh, earlier this week. There is still work to be done. There are gaps that remain. Uh, but I am confident that with the uh, political will on both sides and uh, that, we can, that we can get there. But it's got to be a high standard agreement consistent with what we've laid out for TPP overall. Mike, I know you need to go, but just as you go, and it has been great having you here today, um, one of the things I've noticed is Ash Carter uh, and a lot of the sort of defense establishment has been out there saying if, if we don't get uh, TPP in place that there will be strategic consequences for the country. Is that a good ploy, uh, in other words, to argue a national security rationale as opposed to the economic rationale on its you know, merits? It's, it's, not a, it's not a ploy. I mean, and, and what we always say is, uh, and I, I firmly believe this, that trade agreements, first and foremost, have to be justified on their economic merits. Mm. And we have to look at what they do for promoting jobs, growth, better wages, strengthening the middle class in the United States. That's the main criteria, but it's absolutely clear that uh, TPP is a key part of our rebalancing strategy uh, towards Asia, that it does have strategic benefits there, much as the same way as, as our TTIP negotiation with the EU, given what's going on on the periphery of Europe, um, has additional strategic implications as well, and we shouldn't ignore that. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Froman, Ambassador Mike Froman, thanks for dropping by. Good to see you, Val. Thank you. Thank you.